All right, we're about to we're deep into Mark 13, the Olivet Discourse. I want to catch up where we are. We'll finish that and then push on to chapter 14. In uh, Mark 13, Jesus tells the disciples that this temple at which they're marveling, that it's going to be destroyed. And the disciples, they assume that the destruction of the temple, that's something that occurs in conjunction with the end of the age. Something that occurs in conjunction with the makeover of creation into the eternal state. This is, these events are conflated in their minds. So when they, get, when they get to the Mount of Olives, this is Tuesday afternoon, they're leaving. They get to the Mount of Olives. And then Peter, James, John, and Andrew come to Jesus privately. And they ask him when the end, when this complex of end time events of which the temple's destruction is in their mind a part, when these things are going to happen. And the question is then clarified in terms of the sign or signs that will precede that end. And Jesus warns them in verses 5 to 13 of Mark 13. He warns them not to be led astray by false messiahs during the time until the end. And not to be alarmed when the end doesn't come in association with some particular war, famine, or earthquake that raises expectations of the end. You see, before the coming of the end, before his return, there will be many birth pains. There will be many episodes of war, distress, disaster, and persecution. And it's only at the end of this period of birth pains, a period of unspecified duration. It's only at the end of the labor, at the end of this period of birth pains, that the end will come. And then in verses 14 to 19, he applies that truth to their mistaken expectation that the end will come in conjunction with the destruction of Jerusalem. That will not be the end, but that will be a particularly sharp birth pain within the larger period of birth pains. So when it becomes apparent to them that the city will be attacked when they see the abomination that causes desolation, which Luke explains is the city being surrounded, when they see that, they must not misunderstand. And think that it's time for their redemption, that it's time for them to stand there. No, this time they are to flee. They must flee immediately. And according to Eusebius, that's what they did. They left and they went to Pella when this, when this began to happen. In 20 to 23, Jesus says that, at the, that as the time for the end approaches, the birth pains in this era of birth pains, in this labor The birth pains will become so severe that the Lord will cut them short for the sake of the elect. In other words, he will intervene to bring that distress to an end, meaning he will return to consummate or finalize the kingdom that he inaugurated at his first coming. And when we ended last week, we'd started looking at 24 to 27. And there Jesus says that at that time, see, after the tribulation that will characterize the end of this period of birth pains, this age of distress of unknown duration, he will return in glory to execute judgment. This will be a blessing for the disciples and it will be a disaster for all others. And as I mentioned, this language that you see here of heavenly upheaval that you see used in in Isaiah and other places, this language of heavenly upheaval it depicts what we might call earth-shattering events. That's how I would term it, you see. It it depicts what we would call earth-shattering events, those interventions by God that seem to turn the world upside down. You see these major things. And they were used, it was used in the in of God's judgment in the Old Testament within history, on cities and on nations where you have this great turmoil and the things being turned upside down. But as Donald Hagner says in the uh, New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, there is, however, a tendency for this language to shade into a description 
of the eschatological day of the Lord. You see, this tendency becomes more apparent in the utilization of the same language in the pseudepigrapha and in the New Testament. So what you see here is the language becomes an image for the ultimate divine intervention. So here you have God's going to intervene with his judgment on cities and nations, and this then becomes language that's used for the ultimate divine intervention that occurs at the end of the age. And an intervention that most radically alters this reality, bringing it to a close and ushering in the final eternal state, the consummated kingdom of God. Now, the regular way of taking this kind of language about the coming of the Son of Man in verse 26 is as a reference to the parousia, as a reference to his return to consummate the kingdom, his return in judgment. That's the regular way of understanding it. And that's recognized by common, nearly all commentators on Matthew, Mark, and Luke. For example, D.A. Carson in his commentary on Matthew. He says the coming parousia, that's the word, of Christ or the Son of Man along with related expressions is so regularly associated with the coming of Jesus at the end of the age in connection with the resurrection from the dead, and then he gives you compare closely these texts, that it would take overwhelmingly convincing reasons to overturn this set of associations. Here are references to the Son of Man's coming, angels gathering the elect, trumpet call, clouds, glory, tribes of the earth mourning, celestial disturbances, all unambiguously related to the second advent, to Christ's return to consummate the kingdom. Craig Blomberg in his commentary says, attempts to take the coming on the clouds of the sky as Christ's coming spiritually in judgment against Israel at the time of the destruction of the temple so that all of verses 15 to 35 refer only to first century events have to take parousia coming in verse 27 in a way that is otherwise entirely unparalleled in the New Testament. It is much more natural, therefore, to understand Christ coming here to earth as in Revelation 19, 11 to 16, when Jesus brings with him all the company of the redeemed already in heaven to join his faithful people yet on earth and still alive to meet him. All this is heralded by an angelic trumpet blast text and perhaps based originally on Isaiah 27, 13. So here Jesus is talking about this. He's saying, look, we're going to have this period of birth change. It's going to get intense. It's going to be cut short with Christ returning in judgment and consummation of the kingdom. And he says in 28 to 31, he says that just as there are signs of a fig tree that precede the coming of summer when they see all these things, meaning when they see birth pain. When they see birth pains, the conflict and the upheaval that will precede the Lord's coming, they can know they're in the penultimate stage of history. They can know they're in the second to the last stage of history. All that remains is the Lord's coming and judgment. So when you see the birth pains, when you see the turmoil, the upheaval, the wars, the destruction, the persecution, including the fall of Jerusalem, you will know that this is the final stage, but it's a stage of unknown duration. You see, you're going to, you're going to see these things. The birth pains will occur in your generation, but they need not end then. You see, so if you see these things, then that's what he's talking about. They will live to see these birth pains, to see the general upheaval, the, including the destruction of Jerusalem, but that doesn't mean that they will live to see the end of the birth pains, to see the judgment and the parousia. In other words, birth pains, including the destruction of the temple, must occur within the generation, but need not end there. Here's how Carson puts it in regarding Matthew's account. He says, all that verse 34, which correlates to verse 30 in Mark, all that verse 34 demands is that the distress of 428, 523 in Mark, including Jerusalem's fall, happened within the lifetime of the generation then living. 
This does not mean that the distress must end within that time, but only that all these things must happen within it. Therefore, verse 34, 30 in Mark, sets a terminus a quo for the parousia, no earlier than. For, for the uh, terminus a quo for the parousia, it cannot happen till the events in 428, 523 in Mark take place all within a generation of A.D. 30. But there's no terminus ad quem, which is no later than, to this distress other than the parousia itself. And only the Father knows when that will happen. He's going to say that in the next verse. You see, the, the, the end when Jesus comes, how long the labor will last is unknown. Only the Father knows how long the labor will go on. And so he says that in 32. That's what we get to in, in 32. He declares only the Father knows how long the birth pains this idea that the birth pains that mark and reinforce that you are in the penultimate stage of history, how long those things will go on. Only he knows when the parousia will occur, when the end will arrive. Jesus says he doesn't know. Only the Father knows that. And he explains in 33, 37 that this calls for steadfastness on the part of Christians. And as Carson says, Jesus expects ceaseless vigilance of his followers for the final climax of human history will suddenly come on ordinary life. In the human condition, massive distress and normal life patterns coexist. For the believer, the former, the massive distress point to the end, the latter warn of its unexpectedness. And so that's what you see. I think Jesus is, is letting them know and saying to the disciples. Now, when we get to chapter 14, you now have uh, Jesus here. We get to chapter 14 and verses one to two. The chief priests, they're pondering how they can arrest and kill Jesus. We're now, it was Tuesday afternoon, they're leaving, they go up to the Mount of Olives, we have this Olivet Discourse, and then on Wednesday, you have this plotting going on. Now, Passover, Passover is the 15th day of the Jewish month of Nisan, okay, and that month, that corresponds to our mid-Aprilish, mid-ish April to mid-May. Okay, so it's the 15th day of Nisan. And that year, the 15th of Nisan, it was on a Friday. So it's just like at Christmas. It's on a certain day of the month. And where that day falls depends on the year. This year, Passover was on Friday, and it was the day before the Sabbath. Now, as you know, the Jews, they reckoned the day to begin at nightfall. This sometimes gets confusing. Because the way you think of it is that for them, the day is all of the day and the night before. See, the daylight and the night before. Because they reckon the day to begin at sundown. All right, so they, they, it begins at nightfall. So Passover was from nightfall on Thursday, right, until nightfall on Friday. And the day before Passover which is Nisan 14, the day before was from nightfall on Wednesday to nightfall on Thursday. So all of Thursday day and the night before. Passover is all of Friday day and the night before. So that's a way of just thinking about it. That was the day, the day before Nisan 14, that's the day of, of preparation for the Passover meal, and that's when the Passover lamb was sacrificed and the meal was then prepared. Now Passover... And the festival of unleavened bread, those two things often were identified together in the first century as Passover. That's part of the confusion. As you read the different gospels, particularly John, you'll see this, that you have Passover is a specific day. It is the 15th of Nisan, which here was a Friday. And you have Passover and you have the adjoining feast of unleavened bread. But in the first century, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were identified together as Passover. And you think, well, were you just making that up? I'm not making it up. For example, Luke 22, 1 says, Now the festival of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. 
Right? So, so they, they, are, they are put together. And there's also first century evidence that the preparation day of the Passover proper, so you have Passover's on Friday, Thursday is the preparation day when the lamb is killed and the meal is prepared, then you have Passover, and you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is known as Passover, the whole thing is blended together, but you also have the preparation day uh, before Passover proper, you have that treated as the first day of the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Okay, so you see what I'm saying? So here's Passover proper. Here's the Feast of Unleavened Bread that's known as the Passover. You have the day of preparation before the Passover proper. And the day of preparation is known as the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So do you, do you see the overlap and the potential for confusion? Now, why do I say that the day before is, is, is called the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Well, as Strauss says... Josephus refers to Nisan 14, that's the preparation day before Nisan 15, as the first day of unleavened bread. He's a first century Jew. So you certainly know that then first century Jews referred to that day that way. He says and speaks of the sacrifice that took place then as part of the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover. So I just want you to see how these things blended together. And we're even extended to include the preparation day. Right? Because I, I say that that's significant because I think it'll be helpful to you when I, I make some comments in a minute. All right, so you have that now. Mark says that two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, meaning two days before Friday. All right, Friday's the day of Passover. So two days before Friday, before Thursday nightfall, that's when Friday begins, the chief priests and scribes, they're looking for a way to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. And since Friday began, as I say, at nightfall on Thursday, two days before Friday's nightfall on Tuesday to nightfall on Wednesday. So this is when they're plotting and thinking about how are they going to kill him. And they concluded that they couldn't have Jesus arrested, uh, they couldn't have him arrested quietly and killed during this week-long festival of unleavened bread when the city's mobbed with pilgrims. Because if they do that, they risk creating a riot. So they want to kill him, they want to arrest him, but they figure, no, we can't do that because if we do it with all the people mobbing the city for this festival, then we're going to cause a riot and it'll be trouble. Now, the statement in John 19, 14, this is where I'm hoping some of this stuff that I was boring you with was going to help. The statement in 1914, John 1914, that Jesus appeared before Pilate on the day of the preparation of the Passover. All right, well, a lot of times you can read that and say, well, wait a minute, Passover is the 15th, the day of preparation is the 14th. And is John saying that he appeared on Thursday? Well, the synoptics are quite clear that he's appearing on Friday. So do we have a contradiction? And of course, skeptics uh, often bring that up and say that kind of thing. But that statement that he appeared before Pilate on the day of the preparation of Passover refers not to Thursday, refers not to Thursday, the day on which the Passover lamb was sacrificed, but it refers to Friday the preparation for the Sabbath of the Passover week. Okay, so here's, here, Passover is Friday this year. The next day is Sabbath. Saturday is Sabbath. So he's talking about the preparation day for the Sabbath of Passover week. You say, well, why do you think he would ever refer to the day before Sabbath as preparation day? Well, why would I think that? Because Mark does. In Mark 15, 42. So we know that they referred to the day before the Sabbath as preparation. So what is an easier way to understand this? Do we say, well, there's a conflict between the synoptics and John? Or do we say, no, it's better to understand that when John says that he appeared before Pilate on the day of the preparation of the Passover, he's talking about the day of the preparation of the Sabbath of the Passover, Friday, the same day the synoptics are talking about. That's when he's before him. He's there on Passover. 
when he appears before Pilate. And then the statement in John 18, 28, that the Jews didn't enter Pilate's headquarters, you remember, so as not to be defiled and thus be excluded from eating the Passover. Well, if you're thinking they're talking about, they'd already eaten the Passover. If, if I'm right that this is happening on Friday, the Passover was eaten Thursday night, which would have been the beginning of Friday. But they've already eaten it. So what's going on there? Well, I think he's sitting here, that, that statement that the, that the Jews didn't enter his headquarters so as not to be defiled and excluded from eating the Passover, it could carry the sense of excluded from celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You say, well, why would you think that the statement from celebrating the Passover could possibly mean they were excluded from celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread? That's why I told you they were blended together. You see, so they were called, all of them, the Passover day proper and the Feast of Unleavened Bread that continued were known as Passover. Okay? So, uh, I just give you that for what it's worth because I know when you read these things and you hear things, uh, people say, no, no, the Bible can't be trusted and all of that. So this is at least one way of making sense of that, and it's a way that I think there has merit. Then in verses 3 to 9, now that same Wednesday, okay, which means nightfall on Tuesday, same Wednesday when you had the people who were plotting, they want to kill Jesus, they want to arrest him, but their fear that the crowds, how can we do that, you know, there's going to be a riot kind of thing. Well, that same Wednesday, meaning after nightfall on Tuesday, Jesus is back. He's in Bethany. All right, you remember they left Tuesday afternoon. They went to the Mount of Olives. Now they're back in Bethany. And so we start a new day. We're starting the day of Wednesday, which is, means after nightfall on Tuesday. And he attends a meal at the home of a person named Simon the leper. Now, presumably, Simon was a former leper who simply is known as Simon the leper because he had had leprosy. Otherwise, his condition, that would render him unclean. And he would be unable to host such a, a dinner party. Maybe he's somebody Jesus had healed. Uh, we're not told that. But anyway, he's known as Simon the leper, but presumably he no longer has leprosy. Now, this is probably the same Passion Week dinner party in Bethany that's reported in John chapter 12, verses 2 through 8. Now, I earlier had said that Mark didn't report that dinner. I think he does report it. But he doesn't report it right when he has Jesus' arrival in Bethany. John 12, 1, it says only that Jesus arrived in Bethany six days before the Passover. It doesn't specify the date of the meal that's reported in 2 through 8. So he arrives six days, he reports the meal, but he doesn't say that happened right at the same time. Okay, so you'd have to, you know, you say, well, I'm reading along, I'm going to think it's the same, but he doesn't say that. And I think this meal probably happened days later, and it's this meal that occurs at Simon the Lepers. Now, what leads me to think that? Because at both meals... Both of them are meals that happen in Bethany. Both are meals that happen during the Passion Week. And both are meals that have a woman who anoints Jesus with perfume that's made of expensive nard. So you could say, well, that could happen twice in the week. Well, it could. <laughs> but it seems unlikely to me. And I don't see anything in the two accounts that rules out that John 12, 2 to 8 is the same event that Mark is talking about here. I don't see that. You see, the fact that the, the unnamed woman in Mark 14, 3, and also in Matthew 26, 7, the fact that unnamed woman anoints Jesus' head, whereas Mary, in John chapter 12, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, anoints his feet and wipes them with, with her hair in John chapter 12, verse 3, that doesn't require that they be separate incidents. Now, you may think it does. Okay, I don't think it requires that. She may have poured the perfume on both his head and feet. You see, and then the reports are simply incomplete. One reports one thing and one says the other. They don't contradict. And that just seems more likely to me than the idea that during that week in Bethany, we had two meals where a woman anoints him with uh, this very expensive perfume made of pure nard. So I think here is the same event that we have in John 12, 2 to 8. And the anointing by Jesus 
of Jesus by the sinful woman in Luke 7, in my judgment, is almost certainly a different event. I think that's different. Now, here's what uh, Mark Strauss says about that. He says, Luke's account is very different. It occurs in an entirely different setting in the gospel in Galilee early in Jesus' ministry. Concerns a notorious sinner, surely not Mary of Bethany, and is followed by a different objection and a different response by Jesus. The incidental agreement in the name Simon is not surprising since it was a common Jewish name. Two separate anointings should not surprise us since this was a common cultural sign of honor and hospitality. It's even possible that the story of the Galilean anointing was the impetus for Mary's actions. Okay, so the way I'm reading this, my judgment is Mark, Matthew, and John all report the same anointing event in Bethany during the Passion Week. Okay, Matthew and Mark don't identify that it's Mary. John does. Luke is a different situation. The account of the anointing in Luke. So we had two anointings, one in Bethany near the end of the Lord's ministry, one earlier. Okay, that's to me is how to make the most sense of it. Now, Mark reports here in, in 14, 3 to 9, that Jesus was reclining at the table and a woman comes to him with an alabaster jar of ointment, of a flask of ointment of pure nard, which is very costly. And she pours the contents over his head. Now, some who attended this dinner, they're just indignant. They're all over this woman. They complain that she'd wasted such expensive perfume. What are you, crazy? You just come and pour all this perfume over his head. They pointed out that the perfume could have been sold for more than 300 denarii. I mean, that's almost a year's wages for an average laborer. It was worth an awful lot. And so they're jumping on this woman. They're saying, look, you know, it could have been given to the poor. And they jumped on her for not having done so. And Jesus tells them to leave her alone. And he asks why they're bothering her. They shouldn't be criticizing her because she had done a beautiful or good thing for him. He explains that giving to the poor is an opportunity that is before them constantly. They always have an opportunity to give to the poor, but his presence is unique. His presence is special. It's something for which extravagant expressions of appreciation are fitting because his presence is unique and special. Strauss says his coming, representing the inauguration of God's final salvation, should be a time of extravagant joy and celebration, not solemn mourning. Lavish acts like the pouring out of this expensive perfume, signify the extravagance of God's grace at the dawn of eschatological salvation. Jesus is here as the kingdom bringer. He is bringing and inaugurating the kingdom that will be consummated when he returns. It is the great event for which all mankind has been waiting, particularly the Jewish people. So certainly... It's a time that's worthy of this extravagant expression of appreciation. And Jesus says that she did all she could. Meaning that she gave all she had as an expression of her love and devotion. She took what she had and gave it to him. It was an extraordinary act of sacrifice. And in that it's similar to what we see of the of the widow in, in chapter 12, 41 to 44, who gave all she had to live on. You see, it's an expression of her love and devotion. And though the woman, Mary, I take it from John, probably wasn't aware of Jesus' impending death, Jesus' mind is on that event. See, she's probably not thinking that way. She's probably not aware of that, but Jesus is thinking that way which is why he interprets her action as anointing his body for burial as was customary among Jews. He knows what's coming. So she does this thing to him and they're all jumping on her. He says, no need. She's prepared me for burial. So do you see, even in that statement, he predicts his death implicitly. 
He's been predicting his death. He said it explicitly. Now you see it implicitly. She's preparing my body for burial. He knows what he's marching to. But he's doing it because he loves you. He's doing it because he loves me. Jesus declares that when the gospel is preached in all the world, this woman's act of devotion, not her name, but her act of devotion will be remembered. And of course, that's the case because it's, it's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and if I'm right, also in John and there with her name. So he says that and we see that coming, coming to pass. Now in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 14, Judas Iscariot, he goes to the chief priests. He goes to the chief priests, those who were reported in 14, 1 and 2 to be plotting to kill Jesus. He goes to them and he offers his services in betraying Jesus. You see, remember that they were concerned about triggering a riot. If they arrested him in a city that was packed with pilgrims, but promise of inside help. You see, if I get somebody on the inside, that opens the possibility of arresting him discreetly. Because now I've got a, a spy in there. I've got somebody working for me who can tip me when I can take him when it's most opportune for me. So that's why they're interested. That's why they're glad to hear his offer and they promised him money to go through with it. And the comment that he was one of the twelve. So that simply magnifies the betrayal. You see, that's what it, that just magnifies the betrayal of what he's doing. And the last clause of verse 11 says, So he began looking for an opportunity to betray him. Meaning a time when he could tip them off. When Jesus was in a situation where he could be seized without much notice. He's looking for the right time to tip them when they can come and do what they want to do. And Mark doesn't say why, Ju why Judas betrayed Jesus. He doesn't tell us that. But other Gospels make clear that Satan was involved. And they also make clear that Judas was a greedy person. So these things play in here. Now Mark also doesn't mention Judas's fate. But we do know, we know from Matthew 27, 3 to 5, Acts 1, 18 and 19, that he committed suicide. And the fact that Jesus has been predicting his coming death, he's been doing it explicitly, he's been doing it implicitly, and the fact that he's been predicting his coming death shows that God foresaw and he incorporated Judas's evil betrayal into his eternal plan and purpose. You see, like I say, God is playing chess in dimensions that are far beyond our understanding and capability. So it's like when you're saying, well, why is he doing this? Well, well odds are you don't know why he's doing it. <laughs> because he's up here, and like I say, here we have this act of wickedness that Jesus says, I'm going to die. Here's Judas instrumental in that. And God sees all of this and what's he doing? He's incorporating this into his plan and purpose. Now, who can do that? Yeah. See, who can, who can see like that and, and take these things into account? And then in 14, 12 to 17, as I mentioned earlier, Passover and the festival of unleavened bread, these often were identified together in the first century as Passover. And the preparation day of Passover, Nisan 14, Passover is Nisan 15, that was treated as the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. See, that's why Mark says in 1412, that's why he refers to 14, in 1412 to the first day of Unleavened Bread as the day on which they sacrificed the Passover lamb. What do you mean the first day of unleavened bread? Because the preparation day, Nisan 14, was in Jewish thinking the first day of the feast of unleavened bread. So that's why he says it. Because it's right. So this is what, this is what he says there. Now the Passover was to be celebrated inside Jerusalem. That's how in the first century Deuteronomy 16.2 was understood. 
is that we're going to eat the Passover. You're going to eat it in the place where God has designated to make his presence known. You're going to eat it in Jerusalem. And that was in line with rabbinic understanding. So because of that, the disciples want to know uh, where Jesus wants them to make preparations for him to eat the Passover. Because they know he's, going to, he's not going to eat it in Bethany. So where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover meal? And Jesus tells two of the disciples. And they're identified in the Gospel of Luke 22.8. The two disciples are identified there as Peter and John. He says to go to a city where they will meet a man who's carrying a jar of water. That strikes us as bizarre. But see, the, the thing is, is that that would make him conspicuous because that task was normally performed by women. So if you see a man, he's going to stand out. So you'll go there, you'll see this guy carrying a jar of water. That's the guy you're looking for. And he says that this man will lead them to a house. And when they enter, they're to say to the owner, the teacher says, where's my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And the owner shows them, where's the guest room where I may eat it? And the owner will show them a large, a large upstairs room that's furnished and ready. Okay, meaning that it's a room that's equipped with low tables and couches that are suitable for this kind of banquet or formal meal. So it had to be prepared. And so he will then show you that place. And there to make preparations there. Now, Jesus, again, he has detailed knowledge of what's going to go down. He has detailed knowledge of the situation that may have been the product of divine insight. You're, again, you're just not told. How does he know all of these things that will play out? Or it could have been prior arrangement. There's nothing wrong with that. It could have been prior arrangement. I noticed that he said the man will meet them. Okay, the man will meet them. Well, that has some suggestion of anticipation. Like he's already in on it. Okay, that he will meet them. And notice that the guest room was already prepared. So they just have, Jesus just has them ask, where is it? So maybe he arranged this beforehand, told them, go find this guy and that'll happen. Or maybe it's all divine insight, because certainly that's not beyond the Lord. Now the disciples, they go and they find everything as the Lord had said. And they make the necessary preparations for eating the Passover meal that night, which is Thursday night, which was the beginning of Friday, Right? So Thursday night, which is the beginning of Friday, which is the day before the Sabbath. And when the evening came, Jesus and the twelve arrive at the location. You say, well, why the twelve? Peter and John were there picking out. Either Peter and John went somewhere else and then met them and they all went, or Peter and John returned to Bethany. It's like two miles away, and then they all came. But he arrives there with, he arrives there with the twelve. And then it says in 18 to 21... While they're eating, he tells them that one of them who's eating with him would betray him. One of those who's here sharing with my disciples here in the Passover, one of you is going to betray me. Now, as readers of the gospel, we've known since chapter 3, verse 19, that Judas is going to betray him. Okay, we've already known that. But this is the first time that he reveals to his disciples that the one who's going to deliver him into the hands of the religious leaders was one of them. You see, he's going to be stabbed in the back by somebody in a position of trust and a position of friendship. Ooh. I mean, it's bad enough to get sold out by just anybody. But when you add this depth of betrayal, oh, and they become sorrowful and they say one after another, not I, you know, and the, and the question expects a negative answer. Not I, right? Not, not, I'm not the one. And so Jesus says only in Mark that it's one of the 12 who's eating with him. He just says it's one of the 12 here. Now in Matthew 26, 35, he lets Jesus, he lets Judas know that he knows that Judas is the betrayer. And then in, in John 13, 26, he indicates that to the others by handing Judas a morsel of bread. But Mark doesn't report that. He doesn't report the specific identification. 
Now, Jesus has repeatedly, he's predicted his suffering and his death. And in 9.12, he indicated that the Son of Man's suffering was written in Scripture. And here Jesus confirms that the Son of Man will go, meaning he will die just as it is written about him. He will die just as it is written about him. And as Jesus will say at his arrest in 1449, the scriptures must be fulfilled. This is because they are the word of the all-knowing, all-powerful, and absolutely truthful God. You see, God is the ultimate author of scripture. It is, he uses human beings. And he even uses their different propensities and proclivities and all of that. But he's playing at such dimensions that when he inspires them to write, he doesn't come in and robotically override their personalities. He incorporates all of that into their saying precisely what he wanted said. You see, so he is the ultimate author of scripture and because he is all true affirmations in scripture must be true okay so that's what Jesus is saying the scripture must be fulfilled but despite the fact his suffering and death are part of God's purpose and plan that he was delivered up According to God's set purpose and foreknowledge, as Peter says in Acts 2.23, despite that, his betrayer is under severe condemnation. He's under severe condemnation. Judas remains responsible for the grave sin of betraying Jesus. But God in his omniscience and in his power is able to incorporate that sin into his plan so as to bring blessing out of it. As I say, who but God, you look at crucified Jesus, beaten to a pulp, whipped and crucified, and you just have to turn away and say, what a nightmare. What just the epitome of sinfulness. This perfect man treated like that. What does God do with that? See, he lifts the veil in that case and lets us see how horrible suffering he can turn it into the ultimate blessing. Nobody but God can do that. And so he's doing this with Ju Judas is responsible. But God is so great. He's able to see and incorporate this and transform it into blessing. Now Mark reports the institution of the Lord's Supper in 22 to 26. Now contrary to what we sometimes hear and sometimes say... We are not sure of the details of a pa how a Passover was eaten at the time of Jesus. You hear many things said with a boldness. You have to be more careful. We are not sure of the Passover liturgy, the ritual of the meal, how it was done when Jesus was doing it. There are many scholars who think that what you have recorded in the Mishnah, which is a written record of rabbinic oral traditions that was written around A.D. 210, there are many that think what the Mishnah records about the ritual of Passover and about the liturgy of Passover isn't something, see, that became formalized and uniform until after the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. Okay? So if that's the case, you have to be careful. Now we know something, I heard that bell. We know some things from what Jesus says about how it goes. But you just have to be careful about thinking we have concrete knowledge of all these specific details of how the Passover played out before A.D. 70. But here we have Jesus here. And so he's going to, we're going to have the Lord's Supper instituted. And Lord willing, I'll pick back up there next week. Thanks for coming.